Coming to you via contact-free delivery, I'm RJ Balde, and it's time to hash it out. The Tricomes Hash It Out podcast features conversations about trending cannabis topics. We also bring in industry insiders and influencers to discuss their point of view. In this episode, as a part of the special Tricomes series Convo 19, I'll be talking to Brooke Eagle of Pacific Reserve Brands about how the coronavirus pandemic is affecting the cannabis supply chain and what companies in the supply chain are doing to mitigate its effects. We'll also talk about how lockdowns are influencing marijuana sales and much more. Without further ado, here is my guest, Brooke Eagle. My guest today is Brooke Eagle, co-founder of Pacific Reserve Brands. Uh, Pacific Reserve is a farm and greenhouse facility based in Monterey County, California, that produces pesticide-free and organically grown cannabis flower. Welcome to the show, Brooke. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. Like I said, I know you have a lot of fires that you're putting out <laughs> that never stop. So thank you for taking the moment to have this conversation today. Uh, this is part of, like I said, an ongoing trichome series that we're calling Convo 19, centered around how the coronavirus is affecting the cannabis industry. So first and foremost, how are you doing and how is your family doing right now? We're doing well. Thanks for asking. And, um, you know, we've been sheltered in space almost a month, actually. Um, yeah. Children have been off of school and we kind of were at the forefront of one of the first kind of, uh, I'd say, groups in the community to kind of just stay inside. And um, yeah, it's been interesting. It's definitely been seeming like it's been long, but um you know, we've been doing homeschooling and things of that nature, and at least health wise, we've we've all been healthy, so we're thankful for that. That's good. How's that homeschooling going? I know a lot of parents are. It, it's not easy to balance um, work and kids. Obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of <laughs> uh, people that are, you know, parents that are having that same um, scenario right now, and um, you know, we can talk. I, I we have, you know, I do go into work um, three or four days a week at our farm. And then I, you know, work from the office here at home quite a bit. And so um, me and my wife actually have a tight schedule where um, she gets so many hours of work, I get so many hours of work, and then, um, you know, we split up duties with the kids. So that schedule definitely helps and um, would recommend to any parents going through the same scenarios, schedule as best as possible and give yourselves each parent time to have alone time and also time to do the work you need to get done Um, because, you know, especially when you have, we have young kids, they take a lot of focus and energy. So um, having that balance has been interesting to establish and work within, but it is nice to have some, I guess it's forced time with the family. I think that's um, one of the positive things, I guess you can take away from this whole scenario that the world's kind of going in and kind of make you focus on what's really important in your health and being with your family and making sure everyone's safe. Yeah. Um and then, yeah, with cannabis being essential um, and, you know, our, our business hasn't shut down in any capacity. Um, we did have one week where, as Monterey County put the shelter in place in order, which I think was around March 15th, about a month ago, um, we kind of let off some part of our crew um, that was more based around um cloning and things of these nature that we could stop for a second just because we wanted to see where all of this was going to go. Um, once we got some clarity from the county and the state about what was essential and not essential and um, the continued operations, those employees came right back. Um, and since then, I mean, we can discuss a little bit just what we personally have been doing, you know, with all these new protocols in place, but that's definitely changed up business as, you know, from being normal and um, requiring um, our employees to do different things across the board. So, yeah. So you founded, if I have this correct, you founded Pacific Reserve with your business partners Andy D'Amico and William Tomlinson. Correct. That is correct. Yes. Can you tell me just briefly for those who may not be familiar, just a little bit about how and when you started Pacific Reserve and what drew you to this space? Yeah. So. Um... I guess it was, it was either this, just around the summer of 2016 um, and 2015, um, Billy and I had met Andy. Um, he lived in Santa Cruz, and we met him out in Monterey in the Salinas area um, where he had purchased a farm. And right around that time, Monterey County was um, just starting their new 
cannabis ordinance. So it was us. Um, Harborside had purchased a farm out there at that time and another group uh, named Indus. Um, so we were kind of one of the first three groups out there that was working in this new ordinance um, of Monterey County. So this is still the 215 period and um, setting up, you know, guidelines for growing out there and cultivation. And through that summer of growing on um, the farm together, we really, you know, collaborated well and found a mutual respect because we're all just very, very hardworking guys. And um, through that, um, that farm we were sold, what we were on was actually sold um, later that year. And then we moved across the street, actually, to a, a kind of a bigger farm and more suitable for what we were doing. And we formed Pacific Reserve. We actually started it. Um, in the mindset of growing flowers, but also being a, a cannabis nursery. And the reason for that was Monterey County had a ridiculous tax price out there of $15 a square foot yeah. um, for flowering when it first went recreational, when the law first got passed. It was one of the highest taxes in the state. Now, the nursery tax was almost zero. So mm -hmm. Just for uh, monetary reasons, we really focused on the nursery aspect. Um, I would say the first three quarters of a year that we were a business out there, we had a small 22,000 square foot of flowering going on. Um, about less than a year of being in the recreational laws, um, Monterey realized their taxes were ridiculous and they dropped it down to $5 a square foot, which is comparable to like Humboldt in Santa Barbara County, which has... Um, kind of the same amount of square footage of flowering canopies going on. Mm -hmm. And at that point we pulled back from the nursery business and now we have been, a uh, you know, flowering a lot more. We have uh, about um, almost a hundred thousand square feet of flowering canopy currently. And um, we'll be growing a little bit more. We have about 60,000 square feet of nursery canopy, which supplies us mainly and seasonally now, like now is the season for plants. We do, do minimal plant sales, but not like what we used to. And we launched our brand, Pacific Reserve brand, of January of last year. Oh, nice. And we do everything on site. So we breed our own genetics. We obviously have a nursery. We flower our own plants. And then we actually package and do our own sales. So we have our own distribution as well um, across the state. And um, yeah, pretty much... 99% of our product goes exclusively in our brand. Um, mm -hmm. We do minimal wholesaling. Um, so we've just been really growing and, um, you know, increasing our brand and uh, focusing on that. And so that's been really rewarding. So as a company that sits on the supply chain end of the cannabis industry, can you explain to me a little bit about the unique challenges that you and the supply chain have had to deal with and are continuing to deal with due to the coronavirus quarantines and all of the business closures? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it was interesting because when the, it first got released, sales were skyrocketing at um, most retails. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that was just because people were unsure if can of, you know, the, the dispensaries were going to stay open. And so people flocked and went out and bought a lot of stuff. So Right around that end of the last two weeks of March, uh, we probably saw business go up, you know, slightly 25% or something like that um, of just stores really reordering, stocking up. Um, and how it affected us is just mainly um, just really new protocols for all of our employees. Um, we've had multiple company meetings. We've actually hired third parties to come in and teach our employees the best they can. Obviously, this is a new situation for everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so working with HR consultants and also just health and safety consultants, um, how do you set up your facility now where you maybe used to have employees working within two feet of each other in certain aspects to now have to be six feet away from each other? Um, you know, scheduling, disinfecting um, work zones multiple times a day. People, when they take lunch breaks and certain things, now they have to be separated. So putting all of those into effect probably took us a good solid week of focusing on it and reshuffling and organizing our um, kind of setup at our facility. 
Um, and luckily through that time, we really didn't miss a beat too much in not being able to supply or keep up with where we were at before. We were able to kind of break it up in time. And, you know, obviously the employees are, they want to, for their own safety, follow these guidelines, right? Sure. So the good thing is they're just as active and supportive and making sure that this is a successful way we work now. Um, so I think that kept us from, you know, getting backed up in too many avenues. Um, so yeah, when it first hit, it was just really implementing those changes, making people feel comfortable at work. Um, I think we're very fortunate in the ways that we, our employees have been able to still work and they know that, um, Mm -hmm. and we're unfortunate in the ways that there's going to be no outside support from any, you know, governmental kind of bodies, um, just because cannabis is federally illegal. So, um, you know, we really don't know what to expect. We're definitely living day to day. And as the shelter in place go longer and people are still out of work longer, um, it's going to be very interesting to see um, the trends of buying cannabis statewide and nationwide, um, you know, as people don't get paychecks. So there's definitely a fear there about where this is going. Um, and I think that there really is no answers. Um, you know, I think stores having solutions of delivery, um, delivery is obviously skyrocketed now in, you know, across California, um, curbside pickups, these are all things, but, you know, as we talk to retail partners, this is a, this was supposed to be the biggest 420 in many, many years being 2020, you know, the whole month, of, the whole month of 420, right? And um, I think the feedback is unfortunately like, you know, it got smoked out by the COVID. So um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. I'm going to be really interested on Monday to get some feedback from stores and, you know, just where their numbers at. I know projections were really high for this year. And I think a lot of groups are now hoping to maybe get half of that. So um, yeah, that's going to be interesting to find out. Yeah. I kind of see it as like COVID 19 is like the Grinch to our Christmas and Christmas was like our month of 420 and like the people of Whoville were so stoked about it. And then the Grinch had to come and uh, and jack (laughs) our style like that. Yep. You know what I mean? So being in the cannabis industry, again, you're certainly no stranger to sudden and drastic changes. In 2019, you credited working through drops in both nursery and cultivation taxes to you and your fellow owners being unafraid to, quote, make fast and decisive decisions. So a pandemic is obviously a little bit different than taxes, than tax issues. But how does how do you think that versatility has helped you during this time? And how does that differ to maybe companies that are a little more reluctant to changing or adapting? Yeah. Um, the three of us are having daily communications uh, about which way to steer the company, whether it's looking at trends and sales, looking at um, where our labor pools are short or fat. Um, so we're constantly evaluating um, day to day what's going on with our company. And I think because there is only three of us that are making decisions and we're so tight and think very similarly, um, it allows us to pivot way quicker than maybe some companies that have a corporate chain, they got to run everything up. And so I think that can give us an advantage in the sense that we might be ahead of the curve. Um, you know, where we've already made a decision maybe a week or two before some companies have been able to. And in this industry, it is so week to week um, that if you don't make the right pivots on the right week, it could really cost you a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, so the things we're evaluating now are just uh, expanding our footprint um, for sales. And, and, you know, for sales reps out there, it's hard right now because you can't have that face to face time anymore. You can't go to a dispensary, set up time with a buyer and meet them face to face. Social distancing isn't allowing for that, you know. Um, so making sales. Uh, you know, virtually is, is difficult. And it, it's a new way that a lot of sales reps that have this sale method of, Hey, I meet you face to face. You like me as a person, you see the, the vibe of our brand and what we're presenting here. You get to see the product in person. Well, that's kind of all taken away now. So I think, um, 
there's going to be a big change in how stores work with new brands getting into them and promoting new brands. And, and it's going to become a little bit more of a, a challenge for sales reps to get out there and um, get new accounts. Um, at the same rate, we're finding our relationships with our stores that we've already had, but you know, for a year or more, we just keep building on that because once we've already had that relationship, here we are supporting each other during this time. Um, you know, we're doing specials with stores and, and supporting their bud tenders and doing things like that in every single way we can um, to make sure that you know the patients that they're supporting are able to get our product at a, at a timely manner, know that it's safe and clean product um, and, and all of those things. So I think at the same time as it's hard to get new accounts, it's also a great time to really support those accounts you've had and that we've been nourishing for a long time and re-nourish those accounts and um, make sure that they're taken care of um, with priority because those are the accounts that are keeping the businesses alive. So when it comes to sales, a lot of people have been able to fortunately move a lot of their work to home or to you know remote locations, wherever they may be hiding out. But you mentioned that it's difficult sort of to translate that to sales. Is it that is it really that human face-to-face -face connection that really makes all the difference there that is really completely lost when we're all doing it online? Um, I think with cannabis, certainly, um, you know, there's just the, there's a couple different approaches of the cannabis sales. You know, I think there's more of the corporate sale mm -hmm. where you come in with a very organized package and, you know, hopefully the store feels that you're going to be delivering on time and show up on time and your, your labels are going to be compliant, your COAs are going to be there. And certainly we really excel at those things. Um, one of the, the main feedbacks we get from a lot of groups is, wow, you guys come like with your stuff organized on time and compliant. Mm -hmm. um, and we spend a lot of time putting that together and making sure that's the case because it makes the buyer's jobs way easier to intake product that they don't have to say, Hey, you're missing this, or where's this, or your label isn't actually compliant, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that helps. And I, I think that um, with the face to face time, I know we only have three reps, and I, you know, probably all of our reps have been doing this for a long time. They're not new to this industry. They didn't used to be car salesmen or anything like that. Right. They've been in the 215 cannabis world for almost 15 years, 20 years. And so they have relationships out there and the relationships they have are based on years and years of FaceTime with these dispensaries. Um, and so, you know, their method of sales is definitely like, Hey, you're not just buying a product, you're buying a, a product from a team. Mm. And we want you to learn about that team because we are different than corporate cannabis. And we take a lot of pride in that. Um, you know, we've, taken very small fundraising amounts and all of our profits from our company go back to expanding. You know, we take really good care of our employees and, um, you know, we aren't coming off as some corporate team, I guess, which is in the cannabis world, you know, a lot of stores, a lot of people are all come from the 215 area. And there's a difference in that. We're not, we're not on $50 million in our company, you know, um, we are self-funding and we're competing with those groups that are, that do have $50 million into their companies. And so that's a story we want to portray to a lot of people when we're out there We want our, you know, and that and the quality of our product and how it's grown organically and all these things we take a lot of pride in face-to-face -face time is the primary way to express those things. Cause you actually see it, you feel it, you know, all those things. Um, when you're sending an email off with a price menu, a lot of that doesn't translate. Mm. So, and, and even a phone call is harder to kind of put that through. So sure. yeah, it's definitely more of a challenge. Um, that being said, our sales reps are out there still doing it and still getting new accounts and still making things happen. Um, so kudos to them. Totally. It really is though that fourth dimension that really, I guess, makes all the difference. That, that tangible sort of, you know, sharing the same space breathing the same air, I guess, even though I guess nobody wants to do that now. So that's scary. So we're social beings and as nice as it is to be inside, like even just, you know, me and my wife comment, like you go out shopping and yeah, you got to shop in this weird way now and you got to be really safe, but at least you see there's other humans out there and we're all having the same experience together. Right. 
it's just nice to kind of share that like hey we're breathing we're alive hey, we know people that have been affected by this have been sick we're, we're all struggling to figure out what's going to happen next how are we you know what are we going to learn from this whole experience to hopefully improve the world when we come out of this and um yeah you know that's definitely what i'm focused on in my personal life is how do we transform this to seeing the positive sides of all of this and the changes and not allow maybe business as is to come back completely that way. Um, mm. You know, I think this is definitely a big unification thing across the world where I don't have never had an experience in my life where I can say every single person in the world is experiencing this right now is experiencing either the fear of getting sick or having to stay home or communities telling them this and that. And um, we're, we're literally are all in this together globally. And I think that's a really powerful thing. And um, definitely. Yeah. And see how do we take that, you know, and what do we do with it? It's a very harrowing, um, very anxiety inducing experience, but it's, I guess, ironically unifying in a way it brings yeah. everybody together, even if we're physically not together. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So speaking of the market here in an interview that you did last year with KSBW, you predicted that the California cannabis market would become flooded by 2020 due in part to lack of licensed retail stores and so many people getting into the growing business. Now we talked a little bit earlier about how during the coronavirus pandemic, dispensaries have experienced confusion over whether they would be able to stay open or be deemed essential or not. And then cannabis sales last month saw both record highs and then really dramatic drops right after that, after everybody got done stockpiling. Yep. So based on what you've seen going on in the market, has your stance changed at all over how flooded the market has become? Because it's 2020 now. Yeah, no, I think this um, <clears throat> full season, which would be harvest around October, mm -hmm. you know, like when that's kind of when we could gauge um, what the flood's going to look like every year. Mm -hmm. I am still seeing that there's more planting going on this year than last year. But there's also situations like where Santa Barbara County has really been shutting down and regulating a lot of farms there. So mm -hmm that could be an area where we see less planting going on, which will definitely um, affect the supply chain. And then areas like Humboldt County actually keep growing in canopy size every year. So um, I still think my, my overall guess of it being, um, you know, at harvest time this year, uh, the largest flood the rec market has seen, I'm, I'm guessing that is going to be the case. There hasn't been that many new stores to open since 20, the end of 2019 this year in 2020. I think we're at about, eight or 900 total storefronts and deliveries in the state that are licensed, um, which really still is not that many comparative to when there was around 5,000 or more during the 215 area and, and not as much canopy size going at those times. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be interesting. It's still going to be, uh, you know, their thing is uh, who knows how long this, uh, you know, shelter at place and, and doing business different is going to affect <clears throat> so retails. I think we're going to start seeing <clears throat> those kind of answers start trickling in um, May. Um, if, you know, I, I can't imagine if people are not back at work mid-May, just really business starting to be affected by that. Um, that would be over a month and a half of some people not being employed. And that's going to have some really huge major effects out there in the world. Um, <clears throat> cannabis will obviously always be just like liquor and these things they say in times of depression, something that people will lean to just to help with the anxiety, help with the stress. Sure. Um, and then there's two scenarios that could pop up there. Are people going to go turn to the black market because they don't want to pay the taxes anymore? That could be a scenario. And are people just not going to go buy cannabis because it's too expensive? Um, one thing is the state has in no way reached out to help cannabis. We've had, uh, we've been rallying with our local Monterey County to even like help us with extensions on taxes and things. Um, and they haven't responded to that yet <laughs> at a local level. Um, and then I think pretty soon there's going to have to be some lobbying to the state. Um, they do allow for extensions right now for your cultivation taxes and even excise tax collection. Mm -hmm. 
but that's just a 30 day, 60 day extension. So you're still going to have to pay those. So I don't know how much that's helping you. Um, but uh, as people are short staffed and things of this nature, at least it'll help a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, it's going to be a long rollout here to really explore what is the, uh, you know, the fallout of the shelter in place and this COVID-19 kind of new protocols. And, uh, yeah. you know, I don't think we've even seen the tip of it of what potentially is to come um, right. if people don't get back to work. And that's the the scary thing is we don't know if this is, we don't even know if we've seen the tip of the iceberg yet. We could, yeah. it could still be completely underwater. I mean, I don't think we have. I, I, I mean, we're about a month where people have been not been working and, you know, and, and now it sounds like California at least is going to be till the end of May. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I'm guessing May, we're really going to start to see new trends. Um, and yeah, I don't know which way that's going to go. Um, hopefully we come up with a, a safe solution of getting people back to work safely and still have you know protocols in place but somehow people can start working that haven't been working um and people are just safe out there you know Um, otherwise yeah it's it could be it could just be all industries are going to face major challenges uh, Mm -hmm. including cannabis yeah so just real quick before we go here speaking of not knowing (laughs) when this is going to end or how long it's going to be what's next for Pacific Reserve, and what do you have planned to continue to navigate this pandemic? Yeah, um, you know, we are just doing our best to really navigate, uh, like you're saying, safely, and make sure people we're working with know that our company's doing everything to the utmost, you know, care and safety of our employees and our customers. Um, but, you know, we've had major expansion plans in the sense our we're, our canopy size is going to be growing this summer. Um, we're actually, in, you know, in the middle of uh, getting licensed up in Sacramento for a distribution facility um, where we will be moving all of our packaging, distribution. Um, and so a lot of stuff will be coming from that move, which will be very exciting. We're hoping to be function- operating there in the fall. Um and yeah, and just, you know, we've got a lot of great new genetics coming. Um, we have, you know, major plans are just really, really growing the brand. We haven't really hit Southern California as hard as we wanted to yet. And with the expansion of our canopy, um, we're really excited to get our products out into SoCal more um, and more consistent. So uh, I know that's where you guys are based. And so, yeah. you know, we look forward to getting down there more. And hopefully that'll be happening in early summer as well. And um, yeah, we're just going to keep uh, pivoting and do what we have to do to stay uh, on top of just keeping the business alive and functioning and profitable and successful through all of this. And, um, you know, I, as it's sitting here today, I don't know what that means and don't know yeah. exactly what, that, what the, we're going to have to do to do that. But um, we're prepared for anything and uh, ready to make those calls as we need to. Awesome. Well, I wish you the best of luck, and yeah, I hope to see you down here, hopefully in the summertime. Well, Brooke, thank you so much again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate you guys too. Enjoy the rest of your day. My thanks again to Brooke Eagle for joining me. If you are a member of the cannabis community and have a story you want to share with us, we would love to hear from you. You can reach the show at hashitout at trichomes.com. You can help others find the show by taking a moment to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. You can also join the discussion with industry insiders and get your voice heard by joining the community at trichomes.com and following us on all social media. Hash It Out is produced by David Fortin and presented by trichomes.com. I'm RJ Balde. Thanks for listening.